good for me. All right, you guys, we're recording. Um, I like this discussion that we're about to have, I hope. Um, this is really about the artist's soul. And I think, you know, for me, I've been dealing with cancer. And I think the way of dealing with these things and addressing this, I mean, I think it puts out in front of me really significant tasks and things that I want to accomplish. Um, and it, 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 to me, it parallels you know, what life is about. It's, it's like the whole thing in a microcosm really crunched into a whole lot of energy and trying to deal with it, huge challenges. So um, there's a lot about how one goes about that, I think, that is knowledge that's useful here. To me, I find that I've learned an awful lot from this experience. And I think, you know, the most, one of the most important webinars is the one with Renee Friedman that talks about the artist's soul and coming from that. You know, we, we've talked kind of about money um, and our relationship to money and the idea in my mind that if we're pursuing money, it's kind of shallow and our pursuing money doesn't inspire very many other people whereas if we're inspiring if, if we're pursuing something that others can relate to that if they're inspired by that touches their soul there's much more of a connection and i think that's a much better way to go i also find that in my pursuit of this stuff there's no such thing as a, a happy landing place or oh yeah nirvana i've gotten here I don't find that. I find that it is perpetually a journey and that this experience of being an artist or a human being is about the journey. And the journey is about being alive on this planet and participating in a manner that conforms to what we think we can do. Now, for me, I don't think we get a free ride. I think we have to contribute in order to get. I think we have to keep making, trying to make a difference in order to keep benefiting from the experience, the experience of being here. I know some people who think it's a free ride. You know, what I'm supposed to do is as little as I can so that I can get by for as long as I can. I don't feel that way. Um, so, maybe it's different for other people. I guess I'll back up. Maybe we'll get to this place again or not. Maybe you can ask me about it if you want. Um, in the bigger or smaller, depending on how you look at a picture, the notion comes across still that being coming from yourself, coming from your vulnerable spot, getting in touch with your soul, your inner self, believing in it, trusting in it, revealing it, is a healthy thing. I tend to think this would be the same kind of thing one would say to um, a business person, a business executive, come from who you are, don't try to be somebody else. You know, we, you know. There, there's a book that Clyde was talking about, the Artist Market Guide for 2018. To, to an extent, it's a really great book and it's a really good resource. To another extent, you know, he's talking about how they've surveyed people and these are the ones who they think are the best or the most. You know, the the, the something is the most. That concerns me because I think what we, you, I are after are the people who resonate. I don't think we need to touch, get connect with all the people in Brisbane. I think we need to connect with the one person who might happen to be there whose soul is available for what my artists are capable of, you know, connecting with them. So I think that information in that kind of a book is really useful because it tells you where possible connections can be made. But I don't think it's about casting a big net. I think it's about, you know, focusing and coming from your soul and seeing where it takes you and focusing on connecting with other people's souls. I think that's what it's about. 
I think that's the difference between fine art and commercial art and being a graphic designer. I don't think that is a mistake. I think it's a different kind of activity. And if I was talking to that kind of person, I would give them different kind of advice. I'm not. Um, I hope some of you listen to Foster Goldstrom, who is one of the most amazing humans. You know, just this whole Buddhist kind of money sense and then how much money it manifests is fascinating to me. You know, I have this woman who does acupuncture for me on me frequently and is very zen and connected to the universe and really loves investing in real estate. You know, I don't know. To me, it seems as a dichotomy. I think it's, you know, she's clearly being who she is. Um, I want to open this up for discussion. I want to know, you know, I mean, I think too many of you too many artists before they run into me, try and figure out what it wants, what the market wants, what those gallery wants, what I'm supposed to do, how am I supposed to do, what, what does a successful artist do, how do I emulate them? You know, part of the reason I have you listen to all these webinars is so that you can hear everybody go, yeah, I'm messed up, but I've kept pushing and I kept trying and I kept doing it and I kept putting it out there. And I, and I you know, and because I kept doing it, finally I got lucky. You know, finally I found the connection. I think that's pretty much it. I don't consider most of these people, any of them, to be better than you. I don't think that's the point. Um, who wants to say something? Put up a hand for me, please. Okay, you guys are going to go make me go to, all right, hold on. Holly, I see you. I'm coming over there. You are unmuted. Hi, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, what you said is very true, and uh, it has made a very big change in my perspective and how I'm looking at my art, how I'm approaching what I'm doing. Because uh, for the longest time, I've really been trying to make a living doing just art, and it hasn't really been working. I've gone through periods of maybe two, three months at a time when I can't really do any art because I don't have the money to buy the materials, okay? Now, the funny thing is, ever since I started this course, actually, at the very, the very first week that we began this course, I just completed uh, seven weeks without doing art because of lack of materials. Um, after the first session, three days later, everything kind of changed because... I was looking at everything that is around me. What can I use? What can I do? And I started to do art and I haven't stopped ever since. And somehow it has, when, when you want something, when you really put your heart into something and not, and you don't look at the negative, um, everything gets out of your way. All right. So I found that um, if I don't focus on the money, if I don't focus on what could people really be wanting so that I paint that, if I just remain true to what my heart is telling me to put out, something really just clicks and people sort of resonate with that. I don't know if that makes sense to any of you. It doesn't make any sense at all. And it happens, <laughs> it happens all the time. I, you know, I, I don't get it either, but it's the same thing that I experienced. Yeah, so cool. Thank you. Um, somebody put their hand up for me or wave it in front of their, their nose. Are you guys all being silent tonight? Wait a minute. I'm not going to hold on. There's Jeff. Thank you. Go ahead. Wait a minute, where did I put you? Jeff, you're muted, now you are unmuted, go ahead. I think that it's, I agree with everything you're saying and that you can't, you know, you can't make art under the impression that it's all about the sale. But one thing that I find that's uh, difficult to navigate is that once you, you start to sell your work and you, you, you know, I mean, I have uh, 
the luxury of having a day job that that I don't I'm not required to make a living solely off my art but the but even so when I'm in the studio and I'm painting in the back of my head there is still this notion of um, knowing what has sold in the past and what hasn't and it's it's a it's a fine balance to 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 treat the art uh, as its own uh, living piece of work that's separate from the art market, but yet you want to be in the art market. So I I struggle with that. I don't I I don't know whether to say I don't see that as a problem or yeah I get it. Um, okay. You know I think you should have I mean like. Yeah, you should have a sense of who your audience is. Yeah. Who am I, who, who am I communicating to? And um, some of that, you know, is like the market. Yeah. But some of it is whose soul am I touching? I don't know. I guess mostly, mostly I would think of, well, you know, I mean, not, I don't think it's terrible to think about the market to an extent. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't think you would be really well served by doing by doing paintings on sticks of butter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, mean, I, I yeah. have seen people it's... carve you know sculptures out of butter, but but you know, I mean, it's like so somewhere common sense has to come into it, um, and I guess you have to find the balance. You know, yeah. I mean, the market is not irrelevant. Make, getting money is not irrelevant. Being a prostitute's probably not a good thing. Right, that's true. Not to say anything negative about prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, um, Clara, you, you, you're my, you are, go ahead, since we got you. <laughs> okay, yes, I, I listened to Renee Friedman. Great. I really enjoy um, her, her presentation. And I like that she says, you have to listen to your soul and go with it. And, and then she said that sometimes she's afraid of what her soul is telling her to do, but she, you know, goes with it anyways. Because um, I relate to that, you know, and sometimes I'm like a little afraid of, you know, doing that. Not that, that I care that um, it won't sell, because I mean, I gave that, that idea way long time ago. <laughs> but because um, it, my art has had controversy in the newspaper often, and and I'm okay to to deal with that too. But sometimes um, thinking that it will have another controversy, and I don't know, it's just kind of like um, sometimes I feel afraid. And the, the the point that I like is that even though you feel afraid, if your soul is telling you to do, you you do it. You know, so. As an artist who took the course a few courses ago, William Price, who was talking in one of these discussions, and he says that he asks his soul every day or every few days, how's it doing? Uh -huh. um, you know, it's kind of like as part of a meditation. But, you know, I started doing that, you know, and my soul answers with like one word, two words. You know, and sometimes before I do this, I try to guess what it's going to say because I think, you know, there's, you know, it's, my soul is just my brain. And then, yeah. you know, and then it says something, I go, wait a minute, where did that, whoa, you know, like melancholy as opposed to happy or sad. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. be interesting. Um, he mentioned it might be an interesting exercise to check in with your soul. Okay. I mean, I don't think I even knew I had one until a while ago. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say I do, but I think I do. You guys can make up your own mind. That's my opinion. Ethel, good to hear from you. Good evening. You are unmuted. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is that, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be persistent and following what your soul tells you to do. And here comes she's going to say, but. Yes, go with but, yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that doing that you will be successful. I feel well, like this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this positive, uh, I don't know, mentality, spirituality teachings nowadays kind of 
miss that point of, you know, it still doesn't guarantee you the success. Not at so all. There is that, that, it would be wonderful if it did. Yeah. Life would be easy if it guaranteed success. No. It doesn't. Yes, yeah, so it comes to this anxiety. <laughs> Anxiety, you know, yeah, but you know what I've learned recently is that anxiety is like a waste of time. There's no positive upside to anxiety. Fear has some positive value. You know, you might have a reason to be fearful. I'm not convinced that anxiety does anything good except fuck you up. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, like, you have to continue the challenge. Just because it doesn't work doesn't mean you're going to stop. Right. And uh, in that sense, I really liked what Jeff said, like about art being its own living organism. So one thing is what your own soul is saying, but the other thing is that thing that you're creating has its own language and its own soul and its own will and it's not necessarily the reflection of your own soul it's it may be something of its own so that's a really interesting aspect of like allowing it to choose its um, direction totally correct um one of the nicest human beings i know makes images that look like this. Uh, <laughs> he is the sweetest, kindest, most generous, considerate man. Just a beautiful human being. Um, dude, why are you making these paintings? Because if I didn't, I'd look like them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you know his paintings have a whole other soul than than he does, and I, yeah, I think that's okay. I mean, I think there's a oneness between. This is an interesting dichotomy because I think there's a oneness between who you and somebody help me with this. There's a oneness between who you and your art. You know, it's not like Jeff is an artist and Jeff is an architect and Jeff is a dad and Jeff is a coach and Jeff is a schmuck and Jeff is perfect and Jeff is imperfect. He's all of those things, right? All of that comes into it and all of that comes into his art. Same thing for all of you. Yet, you are not your art. You're creating something that, you know, like a child that has its own entity, its own truth, its own reason to exist, that you're participating in shaping, it's kind of like you're giving birth to somebody. Um, does somebody want to respond to that? Ethel, keep going. Oh, I still had my hand up from the previous time, I guess. I'll take it down. But I, but you're, you know, I, I Go ahead. I completely agree with that uh, notion. I, I definitely feel that feeling of like, yeah, that um, it's not even like art as itself, but even like with each and every painting I make, each and every painting has its own soul and kind of has its own desires and and has its own like journey or purpose in this life, which is kind of, separate from me and mine and sometimes I can be attached to that painting and sometimes I don't feel any feelings but I know I have learned over the years that it still speaks to somebody it has its purpose in and its own journey if that somehow reflects uh, your thought does mine totally how about yours yeah <laughs> Where are you? Is it morning where you are? It looks like sunshine behind you. Yeah, it's 8.22 um, in the morning. Where are you? In Bali. We're all coming over. It sounds fabulous. <laughs> um, I think you're talking... Totally... What's that? Good idea. Come over. It's a great time to come over. We just... Our volcano just stopped. Uh, I think it's not going to erupt, so it's safe to come. <laughs> <laughs> we all have an invitation. Awesome. Margaret, when are we going to Bali? You're unmuted. Go ahead. 
<laughs> I, yeah, when I go to Bali too, it's very cold here in Amsterdam and dark. Um, I found uh, very interesting what uh, Renee Friedman was saying about uh, movement and rhythm. Uh, she was saying that uh, we have different rhythms, uh, you know, during the day. So there is a rhythm of being more active or having more energy or being more inactive. And uh, this in relation to, uh, to movement in the sense that um, as we, I think, I mean, sometimes I really get into uh, um, feeling a lot of work pressure, like having to work and research and it's going nonstop, nonstop, and it really stresses me. And I found out that um, uh, if, I, if I let go, like this summer, I had to take care of my mom for months. And in the beginning, I thought it was a, a, terrible, a terrible thing because I couldn't really do the work that I wanted to do. And then uh, some things came to me by itself. So, I mean, that was kind of, a, um, uh, in that sense, you know, moving also in the sense of uh, embracing life and just also doing other things. I mean, the art is there all the time. So it's uh, also okay to do another activity I, I experienced. Uh, and it's also okay to take a walk, even if it's difficult to do, but yeah. You're right. That's perfect. Thanks. Hey, Jeff, is your hand up again or is it up still? Do you want to say more? You are unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, my statement earlier that I think it's also the it. I don't want my art to be too precious that because uh, something sells and you create it and it feels like then everything then after is sort of um, um, you know, precious, like you can't mess it up. Like, but then your creativity gets in the, it gets um, squashed. So you have to be able to work through it. And I, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, it shouldn't, the fact that you can sell your art uh, shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't um, change your creativity. You're too old. <laughs> You know, when I, was, when I was in college, the idea was if you made any money, you had any success with your art, you sold out and you were a worthless human being. So, yeah. you know, it was like the idea was to not sell. And that, that, you know, to suffer and to not have money made you a better person. That, that doesn't quite make sense to me either. No. Um, I get what you're saying. It's interesting. Now, there's the corollary problem situation of an artist Dan, you know, I don't know, but I don't want to mention his name. But he said, Jacob said that um, not once he got himself a main New York City gallery, he was afraid of changing, being creative with his art. Because if the work didn't sell, the gallery would dump him after one exhibit. And he felt like he had to keep doing the same stuff. Whereas before he had that kind of significant success, he had greater artistic freedom. You know, which is kind of similar to what you're saying. Yeah, but, but what you're saying is you develop relationships with galleries that are going to follow you no matter what. So yeah. That would be my priority. But, you know, a lot of it's a matter of perspective. There are an awful lot of artists in Chicago who go, art in Chicago sucks. Nobody pays attention to my work. I can't do squat. I hate it here. No, nothing's going on. And then I was watching this video from like 20 years ago by these artists in L.A., and they are going, Nobody pays attention to my work. Everything, nobody in LA cares about the local art scene. This is absolutely great. I can do whatever the hell I want and it doesn't matter and I can get attention elsewhere. And I'm going, whoa, fascinating. Same problem, different perspective, right? Yeah, that's cool. So for me, you know, with the sh challenges that I face, it's a question of seeking the better perspective and seeking to find a means, an attitude, a way that takes care of me, mm. you know, so that I can go make better paintings, so I can sell more art, so I can have more fun, so I can 
you know, whatever. Same thing. Except I'm not making art. Um, all right. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to the everybody put their hand in front of their face when I'm calling on Beth. I don't see anybody waving, Beth. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was really um, amazed when you first opened the, um, the program, uh, the webinar, talking about um, how important the soul is because in creating the work, because that is what, what has catapulted me along my entire life from when I was very little. And I didn't really, I paid attention to it, but I wasn't sure that I would ever be successful at it. And, and then um, when I got married, I had to, uh, I had to work and, um, you know, to help earn our salary. And I ended up teaching art, which um, I was, I wasn't sure that was the best thing, but I knew I'd be really good at it. And I ended up turning the teaching into teaching what I wanted to know, what I wanted to learn. And um, it actually taught me so much. And now the art is and has been for a long time a meditation uh, for me each day, whether I do it, which usually I do, or whether I think about what I need to do with doing it and also it's it's sort of um journaling sketching process work and it's, it's all very much about making the invisible visible and um and so in that way it's very personal uh to me and i think that and i do sell it you know i i I, there are some people that can, there are many people that can relate to that and people who are surprised by that kind of transparency. And then it's like the sales happen as opposed, you know, I mean, if you start focusing on the money, it sort of removes the soul part somehow. And you focus on the soul, the money seems to happen. Right. And I mean, you do have to have uh, plans in place for marketing and, I mean, that, that's good to do. It's good to have a way to... Yeah, 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 yes. But the main reason I do it is to communicate um, and, to, and I'm processing my own soul at the same time. I'm processing my own spirituality at the same time and then hoping I'll connect with somebody else who will then complete the artwork in their in the way that they need to, that, that, that it's not complete until it's there. Um, thank you. You're welcome. What about some of the other people we listen to? Did I, did I, I want? Did anybody listen to Foster? Foster's awesome. Somebody talk to me about Foster. Paul, I, I see you gesticulate, and Clyde, Fa, Paul, I'm coming to you. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Did you say Paul? I did say Paul. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, what a fantastic guy. He, he's an example of all these people who I, I'm, I don't know. I think a collector. Is this somebody I could relate to? And, and I, and I just, I, I loved him. I, I thought his approach was, was terrific. And uh, I thought his enthusiasm and his not letting us not, not giving in to not be ent enthusiastic. I don't know what, what exactly how to say it. I I went through some physical therapy uh, a few months ago, and the, I had a wise physical therapist who said, "You know, we can we can go on and and continue to do things and not notice ab about it, and, and that's where we get into into trouble if we don't notice. We don't take the the, the time to see what we're doing to ourselves physically." And I mean, it, you know, I mean, it seems like such a simple thing. I think it's the same to us spiritually. And I, I that's what Foster was like. He wasn't going to put up with any of that. He was going to go for the, the heart of it uh, all the way. And so that, you know, it just it just struck me. I loved his exuberance. It can be a little much by the second day, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Clyde, go ahead. You're unmuted. There you go. Yeah, I guess. Okay, you said you've known him for a long time. And my question is, is he really like that in person? Because he was outstanding. I mean, I, I got the impression that uh, if I ran into that guy on the street, uh, I would just thoroughly enjoy talking to him. And, yeah, I'd probably get annoyed after a little while. But he's just uh, over the top and just uh, – I've watched it, that video uh, at least twice now. Uh, when you when I first received your uh, – uh, the USB uh, yeah. drive, he, his was one of the first videos I just randomly selected. And then, of course, you put it on the list, so I watched it again today. And, yeah. The guy is outstanding. And his offer, if somewhere he said, send me an email, would he, I mean, would he accept that? If, you know, if somebody did that, I mean, I was, I, I'm going to, I'm going to send him an email right away. You know, <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't answered the question already. What was the question? Will he answer me? Oh, <laughs> Um, he's answered an awful lot of people. Yeah. You know, a lot of people say, whoa, I wrote Foster and he wrote me back. I wrote Foster and we're going to lunch. <laughs> oh, he, oh, he's on, he's on my list. Yeah. You know, the kind of, cause I, I was just thoroughly, uh, entertained. You know, what's sad also, is that, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was entertained, but also I did, you know, I gleaned his, his information. I mean, his information is that he provides outstanding. And, uh, you know, from a motivational point, obviously, and he says, especially when you ask about the money, he says, it just arrives. It just comes out of the air. What the heck? <laughs> oh, I wish I could be a foster. I wish I could be like him. I really do. I would, I would, I hope, I hope that uh, if I watch enough, I'll, uh, some of his spirit will infect me, you know, because. That'd be really fun. You know, two thoughts. One is. I knew him really well when he was married to his first wife, who was uh, just as crazy but really different than him, who was like Lebanese or something, and you know it seemed like she was always on fire. Um, it was they were ex God the fights they must have had, the sex they must have had, the arguments I heard them have. Um, fascinating, um, amazing people. You know, and the other thought is, is that Foster isn't all that different than Renee Friedman, but they're totally different. And I mean, like, Renee's very calm yes. and focused and connected to the universe. And Foster's right. really energetic and effervescent and, like, Bali lava um, mm -hmm. overflowing. Um, but yet they're both connected in, in, a, in an interesting kind of way. Um, somebody else talked to me about your journey and the artist's soul and what you heard from other people. Ian, how about you? I could use a little bit of an under accent. Go ahead. You're unmuted. I can't hear you. Wait a minute. Hello. I can sort of hear you. Hello? Yeah, can you come all the way? Come to Northern Australia. That'll be closer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, step a little closer to the mic. Go ahead. We'll 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 go ahead. Yeah, um, I'll speak up loudly. Um, I just made some random notes, Paul. Um, the idea of something uh, uh, not being for sale is interesting that you um, spoke about last week, I think, and the, the second edition being for sale, or and um, a personal thought that I've had that I've never expect, expressed publicly till now is it's too easy to make work that will sell. And I was thinking of a airport novel and um, the idea of having an alter ego, a ghost writer, this sort of, I'm a Gemini, sort of this other side of me that uh, turned out this work that made all this money, you know? And then I thought, well, hang on, why don't I just blatantly make art that will sell? Um, it was very interesting that you said anxiety is a waste of time, but fear has some benefits. Well, I have fear, and I think a part of that fear is creative energy. And um, so take care of yourself, you said. So I found that very supportive sort of... Uh, 
that deeper holistic thing of doing what is right for oneself and um, teaching what you want to learn um, was also, uh, was it Beth? I yeah, guess. yes, it was. Yeah, and um, foster and listen to. So, so there's some random thoughts, but I did make a work when I was at art school in some postgraduate work. It was called, it's easy to make things look beautiful. And um, I think it is for me, it's easy to make things look beautiful. Um, and I appreciate beauty, but that's not what I want to say. So it's very interesting. Um, so thank you. Is, is there a question in there? Is there a question about which, I mean, I, I see that your soul is going in two directions. I don't know if it's your soul, but your mind. Your, your, your soul is going in one and your mind might not be going in the same way. Well, maybe that's what the art's about. Yeah. Maybe the art's sort of about this webinar. Maybe this art is about, um, um, you know, it's about doing something that's, that is, my soul, which is a risk, which I have fear about at this later sunset of my life. You know, I'm 67 and um, I've now got an opportunity to, um, even though I've been doing making stuff, I've got an opportunity to uh, make art. I certainly need to make some money. Um, so um, the question might be, about being self-conscious and that self-consciousness is a part of who I am. So, you know, it is about anxiety, but if that's, a, that's a condition that I think a great many people are in it in our culture at the moment. I mean, it's an anxious world and we all- That's for sure. To, we all cling to, um, I think we look for things to, so I'd like, I wanted to be a sculptor initially and carve sandstone. This is when I was at school. So the actual process of making and using my hands is something that's not that familiar to me, even though I know that's where I need to be. You know, I've, I've used photography and film and computer and all the rest of it. I need to be working with shit, you know, I need to be working with wax or fire or, you know, and I'm, I'm about to do that, but I'm not quite there. And so that's enough for me. Yeah. Um, what was the phrase you used? Something about the self presumptuous. What were you saying? I mean, I, w I wanted what? Conscious. Self-conscious. I mean, this isn't a psychology, this isn't a therapy session, but what Why I'm, not? Well, well, you know, I guess... Uh, I think it actually is. Jeff, let's talk about self-conscious, Jeff. Was this where you were going before? You're unmuted, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, self-conscious? Yeah, maybe. Um, that's possible. Yeah. Okay, now wait. All right, I mean, you can keep, um, go ahead. I want to see somebody else raise their hand if you can tell me how you deal with feeling self-conscious. I see Andy. Um, Jeff, you want to keep going? Are you, should we yield? No, I'm good. I'm good. Cool. Andy, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I find when I am least self-conscious that I do my best work. Um, how does one get un, un self conscious? Um, I, I, well, I don't purposely do it. I just get into that zone where I'm creating paintings or uh, sculptures. In the in the most um, uh, the the art that I do that is that looks similar to the art that you had on the screen, the strange people. 
um, is the art that I produce that's least salesworthy, but it has most to do, it comes directly from my soul. And what I've decided, and what this webinar has made more clear for me, is that I don't mind if my art doesn't sell. If, you know, I would like to make money from it, but I'll do what I can to do what I have to do to make money to support myself. But I decided that my art needs an audience, that it, my art deserves an audience. Um, and so that's how I, that's how I view my art, um, the art that's most important to me and the art that I think is most important. One, your flash drive went in the mail today. Two. Okay. Um, by saying that your art deserves an audience, does that move you past self-conscious? Um, I don't know that one has something to do with the other. I've never really thought of being or not being self-conscious. Yeah, I haven't either. It hasn't been an issue for me. Um, I think it is for two, a fair number other, of people. Um, Foster's, I, he was difficult to listen to a bit, but at the end he gave a definition of, an, of what an artist is and what art is. And I decided to go back. I thought it was very important and it's probably the best definition that I've heard. Um, and so I went back and I transcribed it and I had to listen to it over and over again because I was doing it um, by hand. And so I, I listened to that quite a bit. So I'm going to type that up and I'll post it on uh, the, the Facebook page because I, th I just think you did a wonderful job um, describing what art is. The, the other piece actually goes back two or three weeks ago um, to vulnerability, which I think has is related to the soul. And that weekend, by chance, I had been listening to a lot of YouTube interviews with uh, Francesco Clemente, who's one of my favorite artists. And all of his work seems to come directly from his soul, from what I've seen of his work. And he speaks that way as well. So next week, can you have him on this webinar? Yeah, here's a halftime entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think most successful artists would say they come from their soul. Um, I wonder whether all of them are believable. <laughs> you don't believe Francesco? He didn't say he was from his soul. Him I do. Uh, Sandro Kia, I don't. I don't know her. He was a peer when they both emerged and obviously unlike um, beta and VHS, the right one won out. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, cool. Um, does somebody else want to talk about the artists? Yes, Janice, go ahead. You're unmuted. Um, I really love what Andy just said uh, about feeling that he, he wants his art to have an audience. Um, I kind of feel because I'm starting so late. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm no spring chick. Um, and I've been, you know, building all this stuff for the last five years, not really knowing where it's going. So I loved all the talks this week. I listened to them all. And um, I really thought, yeah, I get it. Yeah, it's, that's good. It, it, it speaks to what I'm doing. I love the whole idea of... Um, it just reinforced a lot of what I'm doing. So even when I'm working on something, uh, in particular right now, something I'm working on, and not really knowing whether it was going to be any good, whether it was going to be anything, but I still have, thought, well, I got to keep finishing it, and then I'll find out later if it's any good or not. And, and this week, I feel like it's kind of turned, and all of a sudden, I can look at it and go, oh, it's something. <laughs> but I was fine with the fact that if it wasn't that was okay. I just needed to do it for some reason. And I would move on to something else after that. Um, and I guess a lot of this course, um, what it's bringing up for me is probably more questions than answers, which is good. Uh, it's me having to question what exactly do I want? And the one thing I can say with um, Andy saying, uh, 
he, he wanted an audience for his art. And I think what I keep saying to my friends and things is, I need to figure out how to get my stuff out there, how to get my stuff out there. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever get paid for it. Um, you it, could just put it out there. I know, and, and, and it's finding the right audience. And I, on one hand, I do kind of know what the audience is, but I don't know where to really find that space or create it or, or how to create it myself i know and i used to do that well you know in theory you should be able to figure that out by the time the course is done and maybe one-on-one -on -one coaching with me afterwards is appropriate okay yeah um i want to say in terms of what you're saying is you guys need to realize that there are no gatekeepers in the art world. There is no test you have to pass to belong. There is no ribbon that somebody hands you or no membership card that has an expiration date. All you have to do to be a member is show up. You don't have to even be worthy. Look at all those schmucks who are already in the group and they're not worthy, a lot of them, yes? Okay, all you have to do is go, uh-huh, I belong. I'm working with an artist this morning, my morning, from Turkey, who lives in Spain, who is proposing an exhibition to a gallery in Istanbul, and she has no resume. But she's doing interesting art that's dealing with immigration and government abuse. And I said, why don't you look at Tanya Bruguera and see if you can find one piece or entity of hers that she might like to contribute to this two-person show you're going to have in Istanbul? And she said, Tanya Bruguera? <laughs> and I said, Tanya doesn't give a shit about your resume. She gives a shit about your substance. You know, come up with something that's easy for her to, um, to you know, to 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 say yes to, and that's how she will. People are people. So on one hand, yeah, all you have to do, Janice, to belong is say, "Aha, uh -huh, here I am, guys. I belong. Thank you for this beautiful honor. Ooh, aren't I awesome?" Um, and the second thing is, is that now that you belong. Those people are fair game. I mean, I mean, they're available to be friends. <laughs> you know, like Clyde can write Foster, and Foster will go, whoa, good to hear from you. Keep up the good work. Bye. It's probably not going to be more substantive than that, but it'll probably make Clyde feel really warm for at least 73 seconds. <laughs> Just a nice thing, you know, and you hear from... 18 people over a period of the year who say, you know what, you are worthy. After a bit, you go, oh my God, not only do I belong, but somebody actually feels like I'm okay about it. You know, so, don't be so hard on yourselves, you guys. You know, believe in what you're doing because it's worth it. And because you're paying me. Come on, go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, who else wants to say something, ask something, be famous? Clara, go ahead. Okay, about um, the self consciousness. Yeah. I have been very self conscious when, like, having to do presentation about the art and stuff like that. And then what helps me is to remember that this whole thing is not about me. It's about the message. You know, I have a very important thing to say that is, it's not me. You know, if I'm giving myself all the importance, then I get very self-conscious. If I put my focus on the message and what I have to say, then the self-consciousness goes away completely. You know, it's, now, it's, that's the total answer. That's the total answer. You're a hundred percent, a hundred and twenty-two percent correct. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I have, I have to remember that when I feel afraid and stuff like that, that is not about me. It's about the message. You know what I have to say. You know what but else? Even more important. than that. What right do you have to get in the way of yeah. your message? What right do you, as a mother, have to get in the way of your children? 
Yeah, right. Right. And take all the credit or, or the, the importance, you know, the center stage. It's not me. It's the, it's the art. And then that relieves me completely of my art. I, I can say, well, I don't speak well. I don't, I don't look well. I don't do this well. I just, it's like, who cares? As long as I can say the message and the people can get it, and then that's it. That's good enough. You know, that really came clear to me in the webinar that we did with Nick Cave, who is the shyest human I know. And I said, Nick, Nicky, because my wife and he went to school together. Nicky, you're the most shy person I've ever met in my life. How do you how do you do this? He said, I'm a messenger. I've got to communicate this. If I don't do it, what kind of human being am I? Yeah, right. No, so I think your answer is wonderful. All right, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I needed to hear that. Cool. Um, Beth, go ahead. Oh, well, yeah. I, I, ha I have found that if I, I'm not self-conscious and because what I am trying to do is live the process. When, when I do artwork, I'm trying to figure things out and I'm trying to be as transparent as I can possibly be. Because we don't know how long we have to do this. We, we don't, none of us are guaranteed that we're gonna live 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, 10 more days. And I want to live each moment fully. And when I do my artwork, when I do that, that's when people respond to my work the most because it's, it's most honest. And a lot of times it's what other people are feeling as well or seeing or it, it changes, the, it, you know, the perception. M my perception affects them and then how they perceive my work affects me. It's, it's like a reciprocal, it's like a conversation. I totally agree. And so it, the self-conscious, what? I totally agree. <laughs> you froze, but yeah, yes. Uh, thank you. No, you're right. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear from somebody I haven't heard from much, if at all. Who have I not heard from? <laughs> Mary, I haven't heard from you. How are you doing? Go ahead, Mary. Um, I'm okay. Then I'm coming um, over to Diane and then Chris. Oh, and William, we got to pick on you. All right, that, and that's the agenda. Mary, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, well, I, I watched all the videos, and I think I listened to Renee three times. She's and so she, she brought up a book that, I, that I've that i actually used. It's called The Artist Way. I don't know if anybody else has heard of it, but um, um, Julia Cameron wrote the book. And I think she was married to Martin Scorsese. Anyway, she developed this, like... Wait a minute. Huh? Please don't define women by who they were ever married to. No, well, she, she writes about it in her book, and she describes she describes the things that it's... <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Um, I didn't mean to throw you off track. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I get what you're saying, but it was also, it was... It was in the book. It was in her book. So well, it's not like... You know, no, I appreciate it. No, you're right. And I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I lost my... No, I know. And I did it to you. Um, so it she talks good. about having um, the import... She has a couple of things that she does that, was, that she did to get out of... She, she had a drinking problem and she used it to get back to her work because she had lost her confidence and wanted to get her work out there. So she did this thing she, where she wrote three pages a day. She just got up and wrote whatever was in her head. And that's usually the junk that you tell yourself, the things that you tell yourself that you, know, that you struggle with. Just write it all out and don't even look at it. And, but oftentimes that you keep going and you get to the thing that is your soul, that what your soul wants to tell you, that, those words. And I actually did that, and it reminded me of something. I think, Beth, you talked about writing notebooks for a long time, and you have this primary source material. And I have, like, stacks yeah. <laughs> of books, uh, notebooks. But actually, I, I really feel like there's, like, the seeds of work that I, I want 
to get to or that I want to do, just don't know how to do it or how to get it out there yet. But anyway, many of the things Renee said, like rhythm and movement and um, I dance also, and that helps, that has helped me a lot because uh, somehow I, I, I mean, too much in my head. So the physical, doing physical movement and dance and also having music on when I'm working helps a lot. Um, it's actually really important part of, uh, anyway, and I'm also kind of shy, so it's really hard for me to. You uh, did good. Okay. Um, you know, when I had a gallery, I tried to play music that I thought resonated with the art. I'm not sure that most people even knew it was on or not. Um, I was trying to pick up on something you said. And it slipped away. Um, maybe it'll come back. I'm lost. Okay, I'm going to go pick on somebody else. Mary, I appreciate what you said. Thank you. Um, William, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about April's webinar a okay. little bit Please. and talk about it by talking about myself. It's really strange to like hear yourself in your ear about a half second after you're speaking. Anyway, so April was going to do conceptual work and then she basically blew it up and started doing landscapes and the work is amazing and it's like, totally borne out by her career, which is like really fascinating. She does really interesting work. And it's just interesting to me, like it resonates with me because I just got out of grad school and while I was in there, there were a lot of tendencies in my work that I was suppressing, right? Like I was working really hard to kind of like simplify and focus what I was doing, you know, not in a negative way, but partially to please people around me or what I think the academic job market might want. And what I found since then, I got it about a year and a half ago, is it's every intention that I had is basically blown up. And I've been working in a lot of like really strange and new ways. And, you know, rather than going to finishing school, I'm like completely reinventing my practice, you know, not from scratch, but. What's your medium? Down. What's up, my medium? I mainly work in film and video. I've been working more in photo now. But the first thing I did after I got out of grad school was I wrote a novel for some reason. And that, in career terms, that's probably really stupid. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. It got me a residency, which is nice. But, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But I feel like I have to follow it. And it's just a really, I don't want to say threatening, but it's a really strange place to be. Um, trying to juggle a bunch of things as they sort of bubble up without knowing what the end goal is. Totally, but it's, it is worth pursuing. Um, two thoughts. I worked, uh, one is, you know, that Ansel Adams basically wrote the cookbook for how to process film. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go back before that, it's pretty experimental. And, you know, you can, I worked with an artist and maybe the process killed himself because he would play with developer chemicals by hand. Um, and then put his the enlarging projector on the ceiling and project on the film on the floor and manipulate, you know, the image by hand while it was being exposed, mm -hmm. um, you know, and violating everything Ansel Adams said. But, you know, I think that kind of freedom gets you pure or they might not be any good, but they are going to be more um, authentic and, yeah. by, and, and probably better. You know, I mean, good's kind of strange notion, but yeah, um, I think if we get authenticity, you, you know, you're, you're moving in the right direction. I think that's good. Hey, Mary, what I was thinking about that I wanted to mention that may be fun for you is in the idea of reading somewhere about therapy and people having unsuccessful relationships with their parent parents and then trying to do their own parenting and have be their inner parent talking to their inner child and talking about the exercise being done as writing and that the parent writes with the dominant hand and the child writes with the non-dominant hand and you have a discourse and I wouldn't be surprised that if someone who is as much into your head as you and I are, that if we're forced to distill this by writing with a hand that can't write, um, 
we might find some truths. You know, it's sort of like the same thing when I query my soul about how it's doing. The answers never are over three words long. You know, or it's just like bam, um, and usually unexpected. You know, so some exercise writing with the wrong hand might be intriguing while you're you know pursuing this stuff. Um, Clyde, you have not said much tonight. Your turn. Go ahead. Oh, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I was just thumbs up with uh, what William, when he said, uh, talked about April. I found her uh, discussion extremely interesting because especially when she said she started out in one direction and then all of a sudden she's told she started doing something else, you know, her landscapes. And to me, when you were talking about the soul, that was her soul speaking. said, okay, no, you need to be doing this. And then that's what's been successful for her. I mean, uh, her, her landscapes are just gorgeous, you know? And, and uh, of course, from what I looked at, you know, I looked, at, looked her up on the internet and on her website, of course, I didn't see any of her earlier stuff, but it would have been interesting to see a comparison, you know, with that. But, uh, yeah, I was very impressed with, I'm glad William uh, brought her, her name up because it's a good group of webinars you suggested for us to uh, watch this week. And uh, she was, uh, between her and Foster Brooks, I was thoroughly entertained and informed. <laughs> Fair enough. I appreciate it. Cool. Um, Kali, go ahead. You are now unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. I'd like to talk about the soul i just feel like art has soul it has a life of its own and like uh, i think Ethel said, every painting has its own soul um i think recently i was really thinking about it and um when you're growing up and you go to school and come back and um, you have all your parents or your relatives around you, when someone calls you, there's a way that you respond, either happily or afraid or, or sad or your, there's, there's a feeling that comes out of you. In the same way, when, when you're standing in front of your canvas and you're ready to paint, it calls you. And the voice that comes out is your response. You may, you may put a painting out there out of fear, okay? It, every, every time you stand in front of the canvas, the art calls you in a certain way and it comes from a different spirit. That's just what I feel. And the way that you respond could be happy and the end result is a happy painting. Okay, in the same way, someone can call you and you feel something deep, stirring deep inside of you and that's how you respond to it. Okay, now, because of what you've said, now I'm, I'm sort of thinking about a question. Does art control you or do you control your art? I don't know, I'll just put that out there for everyone. Yeah, so, yeah, that's it. I'm thinking about that one. I don't know that I know the answer. Um, the question is, do you control your art or does it control you? I suspect the answer is that it's a dialogue, um, but that's a pretty interesting question. Um, I'm looking at the screen with everybody. Um, Beth, I've heard you too much, sorry. Um, <laughs> Diane, don't make me go to Beth. Diane, how are you doing? What's going on? Hi. Um, I really liked April Gornick. I really related a lot to what she had to say. Um, Good. I, I went, I've gone through a lot of the same things myself, and her whole story was really similar. Um, but the, with the art of soul thing, I think a lot of that is um, in the beginning when you first start working, you're just learning all the technical aspects of how to work with your mediums and you know what medium you want to work with, and you're trying all these things. And, um, a lot of what you produce is, be, is a result of that, of the experimentation and trying to, you know, find out what works for you, for what you're trying to say. And so I think, um, initially there is a lot of kind of crazy art that you produce because you're just going through that experimentation stage. But I think once you get past that and you decide on what medium you're going to work with and what, um, 
direction you want to take, I think then you're, you have more of a dialogue with your soul and your, um, your emotions and things play into a lot more of it than they did initially. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I could argue the opposite point too. To some extent, when you get your head out of it, your soul shows up. What you're saying is, I mean, so sometimes, you know, like I encourage people if they hit a roadblock to explore divergent materials or to do something really differently because it gets you out of your head and that soul stuff and other things start showing up and you go, oh, that's interesting. I think I better talk about this now. Oh, my. And then and you're off and running. Um, I suspect that they're both true. And yeah, that, probably to some extent. And it kind of vacillates and it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Cool. Thank you. Um, Beth, I'll come back to you. Don't worry. Um, Ethel, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted also to respond to the question of um, controlling the art. I guess when I, when I started off in the beginning, I would like um, have these visions in, in front of my eyes. I would first visualize it and kind of, you know, know what I'm going for and try then to project it onto the canvas. But then at some point I went completely the opposite direction of like allowing the canvas to dictate everything to me. And I even, there was a, a series of works I did that like just kind of based on a shamanic journey <laughs> to whatever came up in the journey in front of my eyes, I put on the canvas, even if it made no sense, it was like very surreal paintings came out of it. Um, and sometimes, sometimes I feel like, um, I, I, I really feel that if I don't put my mind to it and I just allow it to happen, then really something is being channeled. Like, like there are these messages that's coming, it, it really speaks to me, you know, it, it, it um, touches me and speaks to me. But I also feel that I know that I have a good analytical brain. So now I have uh, reached the point where I feel that I want to marry these two things, this intuitive painting of allowing the canvas to speak to me. And sometimes I, I, I feel that it even commands me, which is, yeah, it's like it tells me what to do. But yeah, now I'm like looking for a ways to, to really like marry this to like to, to, to use my intellect to see what what could go where and to create the frame where you know um, I can channel whatever wants to come through from the canvas right sounds right. perfect <laughs> that sounds perfect fabulous cool um all right so what have I got here one second. Um, Beth, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say to William, um, when you were talking about that you weren't sure, um, you know, what I, I remember when I was in graduate school and working really hard and doing the same thing and struggling. And I was studying, I was at University of Iowa. I studied with Lazansky and Keith Acapella or whatever. And so Keith said to me, who are you trying to paint for? Are you, are you trying to paint or are you trying to paint for yourself? And that, that was the first time anyone ever said that to me. And so at that point I was able to, and I think that's a normal thing when you're going through graduate school, when you're going through further studies, that all of a sudden you realize, you know, this is really about, it has to be really about something that I'm searching for myself. And then, then you go through and that's fantastic. That's fantastic that that happens to you. That's great. That's I think so. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you. Hey, Danelle, I was going to call on you. So go ahead. Hi. Hi. I just thought I wanted to speak a little bit further about what Ethel um, brought up. Um, for me, 
I don't know where I'm going next. I don't know where the next curve, line, dot, color. Um, it's a dance of moment to moment listening. Um, sometimes I hear a color, sometimes it's an idea. Um, it's hard for me to couch it in a control language. Um, it's a dance. Um, if you want to say, does art control you? Um, if your hand is actually moved or your body twists a certain way, are you being controlled or are you controlling it? So it's really hard for me to put language into what occurs. Um, I do work in the abstract, so that allows for this sort of thing to happen. But it's my favorite thing to talk about, actually, is the process. Um, I'd like to get my work in front of people. It, it's my greatest joy, actually, is to see how people respond to the art. Um, I've never sold a painting. I've never intended to sell a painting. Um, I sat in front of a blank canvas because I thought I needed to like it. So the idea of liking art is hard for me to speak about because um, I'm not creating art for people to like. Those are, just, those are just a few words I wanted to throw out with regards to my process. Um, I wake up every morning and want to paint. Um, it's my greatest joy. It's hard for me to stop, actually. Um, so thanks for allowing me to speak. Um, there's this wonderful painting um, by Tom Friedman that reminded me of what you were saying, and that what you were saying reminded me of this painting. This painting is called Stare on Canvas. Mm -hmm. He says he stared at this canvas, I believe, for 10,000 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, where are we? Ethel, your hand is up. Do you want to say more? Go ahead. Uh, no, my hand was up from the previous, uh, okay. but I have another, actually, another topic that I wanted to maybe pick up. Okay. Was that, um, yeah, something that uh, resonates with what April was saying. I remember when I first started painting, I had that thing of like, I'm not going to do any girly things. I'm not going to do any pretty things. And now I'm like, I've been coming back to the feeling that I actually have that, I, I do love, many people say that my paintings are like, you know, sad and stuff like that and scary even sometimes. And I feel I resonate with them. But I also feel that I have suppressed that part of myself that, you know, loves the pretty things and like, oh, I'm never going to do like female portraits. It's like, you know, such a cliche. But... But the truth is, when I've done it, I like, I really feel, I, I feel joy doing it. Like, yeah, there is this fear of doing like pretty things. Which definitely like, I have many different directions I want to go to, but I recognize how I suppress this uh, wanting to do something beautiful, like, ooh, flowers. No, that's, that's not. That's so decorative. Yeah. Can you address that? Who was talking earlier in the webinar about, can I address that? No, I don't want to. That sounds difficult. Who was talking um, earlier about, the, was it Mark? Who was talking earlier? Ian wants to say, sorry. Ian what? Go ahead. Somebody was talking earlier about the capability of making pretty things but not wanting to. I don't think that was Ian, though. Ian, you got the microphone. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, it was me, I think, or well, one of the people. Okay, yeah, good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so that's all. I just wanted to say it was me. It's great. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Making pretty things. No, no, no. It's easy to make pretty things. So you're enjoying not making pretty things? Well, I'm playing with the idea that maybe I can make things that do both. 
contrast. I don't see why not. No, well, that's, you know, that's, that's why I've, we're moved, isn't it? It's the spectrum of emotions and feelings that we're all in the human condition living today. Um, Janice, go ahead. Wait. Yes, Janice. Ethel, I just have to say, paint something pretty. I mean, I think really so much about what we're doing is if it scares you, shit, that's what you got to do. Even if it's nothing to sell or whatever, but I just think if there is something that's terrifying you. Yeah, I think you're probably right. If that's, you know, go it, into it, it and do it. Find it, out what it is. If somebody was afraid of doing something ugly, you would say, damn it, go paint something ugly on purpose. Yeah, exactly. Like paint the prettiest thing you can think <laughs> of. Like just pull it all out, do pastels, do like, just be really, really pretty. I'm, whatever, just canvas, just paint. <laughs> I think Janice is right. I can show us all. <laughs> yeah, we'll look for it next week. Anne, I see your hand. We haven't heard from you all evening. Go ahead. Wait, we all, I'm doing it. Now you're, no, stop. No, it's not working. Okay, you do it. You're still muted. I can't unmute you. Is this the problem you were having? There you go. Yeah, something with my computer. Anyway, if you want to paint beauty, just do it. For years, I was tormented by people in graduate school telling me my work was too beautiful. And then when I joined a cooperative gallery, it was like, oh, your work is too beautiful. It's too saleable. And that was a dirty word. It's not disturbing enough. And, you know, so I did a series of paintings of eels from the Shedd Aquarium because I thought that they were the strangest most ugly creatures one could paint, but I painted them in bright pastel colors and violets and such. And I also likened them to different members of my family. I mentally gave them a different persona and people loved it and they sold, you know, but I mean, it's like it was a marriage of the beautiful and the disturbing. But I'll tell you to this day, one of the images that I consistently paint are flowers and um, when I was in grad school, a teacher gave some very good advice that your work should be divided into three categories. Number one, experimental. Number two, doing works that you know how to do that exploit your, you know, that show your technique and that are more easily sellable. And then works that are deliberately done to push yourself, like for exhibition and juried shows. And, you know, it's a little, it's a lot like what we've been talking about tonight. I mean, all three should come from your soul. You know, you shouldn't think, well, okay, I've got an art show this weekend. And I know that, I mean, years ago I did art fairs, but I don't anymore. Like in this area, paintings about seashells sell. So I'm going to do some seashells. I mean, that's never a motivation. But if you feel like it, if it does motivate you from when you get up in the morning you should do it absolutely we i'm gonna go look for seashells um danelle your hand is up did you want to say something additional you are unmuted um i i didn't put my hand up but okay, there's um, some before. do you want to say something um you don't have to boy i was painting you caught me off guard. I was cool. listening. <laughs> awesome. Okay, you're off the hook. Um, anybody else? We could wrap it up too, but who have we not heard from enough, Chris? Hi, Chris, Hello. you're unmuted. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. Good evening. Good evening. Anything um, to add? I, no, I've enjoyed listening. I do want to say that Ian made my soul feel something. I think the way Ian talked about emotion and the time we're in made my soul feel touched. And the other thing that I was feeling tonight is how hard it is to talk about the soul. Because I think you've done pretty well. I think you all have done amazingly well. For me, it makes me very nonverbal. And I've been, I've 
I've been impressed by how much people could articulate things that felt soulful. True. But it makes me feel quiet and um, nonverbal. That's and certainly I, allowed, isn't it? That's, just, that's, you know, yeah. And I have to agree about Ian. Ian seems like he has a fair amount of wisdom, some of which he hasn't quite gotten in touch with, but it's there. Uh, you picked yeah, it, it, just, it, it felt touching. Yeah, you picked up on it too. I get it. Yeah. It's cool how, you know, he can be so many miles away from where, you know, we are. Um, and yet it seems so close. And yet, you know, that connection, that's really nice. Thank you. Um, anybody else want, <clears throat> want to say anything before we wrap this up? <laughs> Susan, you're hiding. Oh, look at the sun is setting. It's really beautiful, of course, again. Go ahead. Um, hey, I just wanted to say that I was, uh, I was motivated in the last, last uh, couple of weeks to think about um, how I'm contributing to the community. And so I, I pulled right back and, and thought about what I do. And so in a, in a nutshell, I, I said, okay, I want to do relationship between physical and mental health. And so I had this idea that I'm working on for about three weeks. And I finally, I went into this computer store and I talked to the people and they said that, that, that where I am today is that I need a 3D digital motion mapping machine, which they only do in Hollywood. But the journey has been really interesting because I've had to go out of my way to talk to different people. Like I had like six different people about my artwork and how it was going to influence other. And it's, so it's been, it's been uh, to have a conceptual idea that is very large is very interesting because, you know, I've had to break it down into smaller bits and so we'll see where I go with that. Anyway, so that's what I'm talking about my soul tonight because I really had to search, uh, think, think, think about what, it, what between now and the time I die, what actually do I want to contribute with my artwork to the community? So thank you for that. That's really cool. I don't understand the idea between 3D mapping and working with the community, and I don't understand why an artist can't make two T 2D mapping sources constitute equal one 3D. If 2D mapping exists, we could do that. This is why I have really fun. This is why I go with the one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's like, wait a minute, if we can do that, then we go, duh, 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 duh. then I go, okay, you do it. Um, yeah, okay, so I'll take you up on that. Cool. Look into that. Um, anybody else we have not heard from this evening? Anybody hiding? Joe? Joe, you got the last word. You are on. Okay. Can you hear me? Indeed. Okay. So I noticed that um, there's a lot of diversity in people's concept of the word soul. So it got me to thinking about what, what my take on what soul is about. And for me, it implies a, um, a larger sense of, of self, a, a higher, wiser sense of self beyond my ego or my personality and beyond my fears and doubts. And I, I think it's a state of self-honesty and, and it's a state of emotional alignment with, uh, with my emotions and my beliefs. And I like to think that developing a connection with my soul is really Wait a minute, wait a minute, let's stop, Joe. Somehow I messed up and I muted you and you said somehow that's that. All right, you're unmuted. I no. Are you unmuted? Say something. Hello? Yeah, you're okay now. Go ahead. You're saying somehow establishing a connection with your soul. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I feel bad about messing this up. Um, uh, did I, did you hear where yeah, I was trying to make? Go ahead, repeat the last part. Uh, did you hear where I was mentioning about connecting with the soul through your intuition? Say it again. Okay, so I thought about, well, how do I connect with my idea of what a soul is? And I, and I think that's through my intuition, through the same intuition that we use as artists to to get information about decisions we make and make in our art. And I think the more information you have, the more honest you are, you are the, the better decisions you can make with your intuition. And um, so I think that intuition co connects to that larger sense of yourself. And I, and I like to think that there's actually a, a, a practical approach 
to listening to your soul, to, uh, to having sort of a, a, a spiritual or a positive approach to your life. I think, I think if you're more on the side of being positive and less uh, fearful and doubtful, I think you can communicate to people uh, more enthusiasm, uh, more uh, a sense of sureness about yourself. I think it's an attractive quality. And, and I, think, um, I think you're more likely to relate to those people that, that you want to connect with. And, and so therefore, I think connecting to your soul is really a practical thing in terms of success, not just making money, but successfully communicating your ideas and your, whatever interests you, your joy um, to other people. Thank you. I think that's really beautiful, beautifully said, and sums up a lot of stuff we've been talking about and needed to hear. And I think all of you have done a really wonderful job tonight of expressing yourselves and listening to others and being in touch with the soul. And I think Joe's point of view about it being, you know, strategically wise makes sense. And I want to conclude by saying I think it's the same thing about being vulnerable. You know, I think we feel like those are difficult places to go. But if we overlook the difficulty, there's a lot of value that we get and that our art gets by us being in touch with our soul and are in touch with our vulnerability and having a willingness to share it. Um, this has been good. You guys are great. I will see you next week. You are all unmuted. Everybody, thank you very much, everybody. Thank good night to you. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good night to you. Bye-bye.